Hello, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm also a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Rob and I are back at it for our weekly chat about markets and geopolitics. Uh, It's a deceptively quiet week in markets and geopolitics because we think that the um, general hysteria about the banking crisis is a little bit overwrought. And we also think that the focus on China, Russia's ties in the context of that very impressive looking Xi Putin meeting was also a little bit overwrought as well. When you actually pull back the surface, it was a relatively quiet week. Turkey was arguably the country where there was the most geopolitical intrigue at work, but we've got a full episode, an hour long episode on Turkey coming up on Monday. So I didn't want to step on that either. So we took a little bit of a step back. We talked about what's going on in markets, what our view on inflation is, where debt levels are causing us to focus on in terms of our medium term time horizon. And then we take a step back and talk about China, Russia relations and really let ourselves imagine what China's future might be. Um, So hopefully it's an objective conversation about where China's at in its development, whether it's unique or not compared to the United States and the Soviet Union and what the future might have in store for it. So um, a little bit more of a one of those episodes where we took a step back and tried to think about the world a little bit more generally. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, Whether you do or not, you can always email me at Jacob at cognitive.investments if you want to tell me how you enjoyed the episode or if you want to hear more about how to acquire access to our research. Um, or you want to hear more about how we manage client assets and you might even be interested in becoming one. So without further ado, cheers and see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. Well, Rob, for once I'm in my my own office and not huddled over some desk in a in a hotel somewhere talking to you. So I feel very comfortable right now. How's it going? It's amazing how good it is to just have a place where you can go to every day and sit down in the same place with the same notebook and the same computer and you know, have your routine. Yeah, although you're already giving me wanderlust just by describing that routine. So <laughs> so, so excitingly when you did that. Um Listeners, we, we had trouble coming up with a thing to talk about uh, in this podcast, which might be surprising. It might seem like there's a lot of stuff going on in the world, but I, I often like to go to the front page of, you know, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or pick any newspaper that you want. And, you know, sometimes there'll be headlines where you think to yourself, you know, like a year from now, I'll remember that that was a thing that happened in 2023. If you go to, for instance, just the, the front page of the New York Times today, it's uh, about TikTok's chief being interrogated by House lawmakers. It's about, um, you know, more stuff about Trump and hush money and this, that, or the other thing. Um, To the extent there's anything about sort of, you know, foreign policy, it's a little bit related to the Russia-Ukraine war, but in some ways it's not even really focusing on the big stuff with the Russia-Ukraine war. There's a migration agenda with, uh, excuse me, there's not a migration agenda. There's Biden is visiting Canada and migration is on top of the agenda. The United States wants Canadian help apparently with dealing things with Haiti. I dare say that none of these things will be like, you won't remember these things happen in 2023. They, they won't be that important. But Rob, I think the place to start um, as we just kind of give a lay of the land, what's going on in the world, the things that we're focusing on and what maybe ironically is a quiet week for us is um, I can't tell you, I'm still getting inbound um, questions from people who are normally interested in geopolitics who keep asking me, uh, are we about to have a banking crisis? Is Are these debt levels? Like, should I be worried? Is this Lehman 2.0? I know we we dealt a little bit with with SVB last week. What we've got the Credit Suisse stuff. We've got, um, you know, the U.S. was going to guarantee deposits, and then Jan Yellen, Janet Yellen said no, and then the market swooned, and then the market's up. Um, you know, so g- give us a, a sober take about where you think we are and why we're. I'll, I'll try to play the foil and be the, but the economy is going to collapse. But how about you give us the sober <laughs> take about what we think is actually going on? Yeah, and I have to say it's kind of nice to have a. A week where the top-down geopolitical stuff is pretty quiet because we spend so much time digging into companies and technologies and all this research that we're doing that to not have to put out fires for once is uh, is kind of a relief. Um, but on the Silicon Valley bank issue and sort of where we're at, so we're getting a lot of people calling us, um, you know, cl- research clients and and others that we know who are all looking to short 
banks right now. And that seems to be the big trade du jour. Everyone is looking about shorting banks. We get this um, email from uh, from a service owned by Fidelity that lends out stocks to short. And they actually had a special email this week about here's all the regional bank stocks that you can borrow to short and how much it costs to borrow them. So you can see that you know that's where everyone's attention is focused. Um, but I, I frankly, I just don't think it's very interesting. And if you look at what's happened in markets um, in the aftermath of the events of the last few weeks, um, I think the way I would classify it is sort of a healthy normalization. So um, the credit markets are looking okay. If you look at the window for companies that are raising uh, raising capital or issuing bonds in the United States, that's reopened earlier this week. So you had everything closed down when everyone was freaking out for a few days. Um, but on Monday, you started to see big companies start to tiptoe back into that market. And then on Tuesday, you really saw um, more of a, a deluge of, of companies raising capital again. So things are sort of getting back to normal in some ways. Uh, we had the Fed meeting uh, yesterday and they did sort of what a lot of people expected them to do. They they hedged. So they raised interest rates, um, but at the same time, uh, they issued the statement, raised the rates, but then Powell came and gave his uh, press conference and sounded sort of a, a much more dovish tone, a much more reassuring tone. So you can see they're sort of doing the one-two uh, act there because they're in a bit of um, a pickle is not the right word, but we've talked a lot about their determination to control inflation and um, how we think inflation is more entrenched than the consensus assumes and how we think you know, the Fed is going, going to be more hawkish than people assume. Um, this is a real challenge to that because now they have a financial stability issue on their hands and they have to make sure that, you know, they're not going to be raising rates too aggressively. They're not going to break something. Um, and so far from what we've seen, it doesn't look like they've broken anything, even though a lot of people are concluding that and a lot of people are taking the events of the last few weeks and saying, okay, now we're really rolling over. Now things are really going to start to the wheels are going to fall off the wagon here. Um, I don't think that's true, um, but the Fed has to balance both of those things. They have to maintain the fight against inflation. They have to keep rates, you know, where they need to be to do that. But at the same time, they're cognizant of not freaking people out too much. So this is the um, tricky spot that they're in at the moment. Well, and, and that's a good point because um, one of the things that crossed across, that came across my desk that I put in the knowledge platform this week that was you know something unexpected or something where I stopped and I was like that doesn't really make sense with everything that else that is going on or at least with the general market narrative is um, the United Kingdom saw an increase in inflation from ten point one percent in January up to ten point four percent in February. Uh, food was a big part of that, but even when you stripped out food and energy, it was um, from 5.8% to 6.2%. And so the Bank of England raised rates again and was saying, we think that, you know, rates are going to come down, or uh, not rates, that inflation is going to come down aggressively over the next half of the year. But I feel like we're sort of in this place with market narratives where, like, and we talk about this all the time with market narratives, where things haven't happened the way that people expected. And it's not that a new narrative is taking hold. It's just like this Seventh Day Adventist maneuver where it's like, all right, like, the, the, the return of Christ did not happen this time, so it's going to happen next year on this date. We just got the date sort of wrong. So now it's like Chinese demand is not here in force. Eh, it's going to happen in the second half of the year. Inflation hasn't slowed down quite yet. Eh, that's okay. We're still going to slow down the rate increases. And I, by the by the second half of the year, these inflation rates will start to come down pretty, pretty harsh. Now, as I said on the knowledge platform, the UK is a little bit weird because, you know, Brexit is happening. And when you blow up your relationship with your most important trading partner, like you will see sort of these weird back and forth with, back and forths with inflation. But to your point, um, it doesn't look like the economy is broken at all. If anything, 
Like the things that we're seeing suggest that the economy is doing okay, despite the fact that the Fed is raising interest rates. And the the rejoinder to the whole Silicon Valley Bank thing is that this is not like 2008, where one day we thought mortgages were secure and land values were secure, and then the next day they weren't. This was a bank that caters to the tech industry after a period of artificially low interest rates, like arguably unprecedented going back, I guess, to World War II or something like that. We had very low interest rates around that time. Like You would expect to see stress in that part of the economy. So the rest of the economy seems to be doing well. And I don't know, I mean, we've been talking for a long time about how, I mean, I just wonder if that that UK inflation print is a canary in the coal mine. Do you think we actually might see a reacceleration of inflation? And that's something that the market isn't quite prepared for because we haven't fixed any of the structural problems that led to higher prices in some of these areas. Um, the short answer is yes. And it wasn't just in the UK, actually. Uh, Germany released its hmm. PPI numbers this week, the producer price index. So these are the prices paid by businesses, not by consumers. And that beat expectations by a pretty meaningful amount. Um, so it's fairly widespread where you're seeing these surprising surprises. I know that sounds like a paradox. Um, but you're not really seeing evidence. You're seeing more evidence of sort of the uh, durability of inflation and some of these factors. And in the US, I think it's no different. And this is one of the big sort of variant views that we have right now is we think that there's a very high probability that inflation does reaccelerate, And I think that would really take people by surprise. Um, and we've talked about the inventory cycle in the US, um, which is something I've been harping on almost every week, but just to rehash what that is. So inventories are the most volatile part of the business cycle. Um, and in, in the last few quarters, we've been experiencing an inventory recession because businesses build up inventories very aggressively in the first part of 2022 um, because in, in large part, they were responding to the shortages that they suffered in late 2021. I don't know if you remember Christmas of 21, no one could get anything for, for Christmas because the supply chain snarls screwed everything up. So, you know, you were getting fruitcakes and, and things like that coming not until January, February, which sort of, you know, screws up your seasonality. Um, so how strange I, I found that Hanukkah was completely unaffected. Hmm, I wonder what that could be about. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, so everything got screwed up. Businesses overordered in 2022, and then they found themselves with too much inventory, which they've been running down and running down, especially because everyone expected us to tip into a recession. Well, where are we now, right? Inventories have been getting run down, run down. Chinese factories have been totally offline. The, there's empty cargo ships sitting around. Like it wasn't that long ago when the news story was, oh, there's 108, you know, uh, container ships queued up outside Long Beach, you know, waiting to unload because there's this enormous uh, bottleneck in the system. Now, you know, they're going around empty. There's no queue. They're s just sitting there. So we're in a completely opposite scenario from an inventory standpoint. And at the same time, the businesses that determine, you know, how much inventory they're going to build are looking at the economy and they're increasing their estimates of how, how durable demand is going to be. So if you look at, you know, the, the earnings calls that were just completed, businesses are out there giving pretty optimistic guidance for 2023 and it's not the end of the world and they're adjusting their expectations upward. So if you get a rebuild of the US inventory cycle and sort of a normalization there, you know, because the door swings both ways. And as we talked about, things are going to be super volatile in both directions. And this is the new normal. If you get that normalization back in the other direction again, that's going to be a significant bolus to demand to growth. And that's going to increase uh, goods inflation, which in the last few quarters has been really coming off the boil and helping to dampen overall inflation. So that plus the labor issue could be a major problem. Um, go ahead. Well, I want to ask of, 
a question that will probably seem simplistic and it is simplistic in a way, but you'll, you'll kind of help me break it down. Cause I was talking about this with one of the analysts on our team and he was, he was tr- basically trying to play. The, I, I don't think he was playing the devil's advocate. I think he was a little more, more worried about it than me. And he kept on bringing up the issue of debt and why increased indebtedness, especially in the United States or in the global economy or for companies might affect things. And I confess that I don't exactly know how to deal with or process or benchmark debt. You can go back and find brilliantly written pieces by me from 2015 and 2016 about the Italian banking crisis and how non-performing loans and high indebtedness in Italy was going to lead to this crisis in the European Union. You're going to have to bail out Italy. Uh, there was a like there was a banking issue in Italy. They figured it out and they've been doing fine. And now it even looks like you know it- Italy looks like a good growth market, especially with um, EU recovery funds. Um, Japan has, you know, so much debt and yet it still hasn't collapsed in on itself. China seems to find more and more debt. The United States has plenty of debt. When you look at how um, U.S. consumers are buying more and more things, they're not getting the stimulus checks anymore. They're just putting shit on their credit cards. They've, they've gotten used to whatever standard that they had before. And even if they don't have the cash in the bank account, they're like, well, I need this thing. And I, you know, uh, the government, is, if they're going to bail out SVB, they'll probably bail out me too. So I'm just going to put it on the credit card. I guess what I'm asking you is at what at what point at, does debt at the macro level actually start to affect these things? Because I have so often, uh, another example of this, when COVID first started, like March, April, 2020, before I even had Perch or CI or anything else, I was an independent analyst doing my own thing. I put out this piece about how I thought debt levels were going to increase astronomically in the context of COVID, and that was going to be bad for the global economy. I was right that debt levels increased astronomically. Totally wrong that that was actually going to have a negative downside con- uh, consequence. Like we just found more and more debt. We keep rolling it over. So how how would you respond to somebody like me who's coming to you and saying, okay, that's all nice, but eventually these things have to be paid back, right? Eventually debt is going to be an issue. Is it? Do we just keep on printing more and it's all numbers on a sheet? Or do you think that that could weigh on the situation? Because debt levels are increasing just about everywhere. And the United States is leading the pack there in some ways. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. It's it is an issue. Some people will argue that debt doesn't matter. Of course it matters, um, but you have to think about it in two ways, right? The first is quite simply, how does the service of debt impact different actors in the economy, their their income statements? So, like the U.S. government has to pay interest on its debt. That's money coming out of the treasuries account and going into the accounts of bondholders. How does that affect things? Same for individuals, businesses, whatever. So literally the debt service costs is is number one. And number two is how does the psychology of debt impact the decisions that people make? Mm -hmm. So there's something called like financial distress costs, which is another way of just saying that people or actors who have a lot of debt under certain circumstances can behave very differently than they would otherwise. So if you know you have a lot of debt, you know, the, the Japan is the classic example. So people will often point to Japan in the 1990s where you had J- Japanese corporates um, that had accumulated massive amounts of debt. And when the bubble burst in 1990, they spent the next 15 years, rather than investing in capacity expansion and the things that lead to growth, they spent the next 15 years paying down their debt. Yeah. So this is the theory called the balance sheet recession. Um, so that's that's the background. Where are we in the U.S. today? So you were correct. COVID caused debt to explode, primarily on the government balance sheet. So you have to think of it in two sides here. There's the public balance sheet, which has absolutely exploded in terms of debt levels. And that's really a political question. Is the government changing its behavior? I mean, there's some inklings that Biden is trying to at least give an impression of controlling the deficit. Um, but so far, it's been okay. Uh, as far as, you know, if the government were to come out and say, hey, we're going to slash government spending and we're going to raise taxes, like that is debt having a real impact. Mm-hmm. Um, the other side is the private sector. So everyone assumes, if you're not looking at the numbers, that U.S. consumers are leveraged to the hilt and they have all this debt. That's not true. The U.S. consumer has been paying down its debt since 2007, 2008. Um, So over this whole period, household balance sheets have actually been getting healthier and healthier and healthier. And right now we're in a pretty good state on average. Like, of course, there's differences 
for different income levels and income inequality has an impact on that because there's some people who have no problem with debt and then there's you know a subset of society that is constantly in debt mm. those are kind of longer term issues which we don't have to get into um the problems with debt i think if you want to focus on okay where does this create issues is is threefold the first is the government one which we talked about which everyone kind of knows and that's very open to interpretation like at what point does that become unsustainable at what point do you hit a tipping point you know a lot of people cite the um famous reinhardt rogoff study from this time is it's it's different where they claim that once you get over 100 percent debt to gdp that's when you hit some tipping point later academic research has shown that to be kind of bullshit. so no one really knows no one really knows where um on the government side um the more applicable and relevant thing today is not the household sector but the corporate sector and i think if you were to look for problems with debt today that's where you need to look because what's happened in the last five years is that uh, corporate profit margins have been very high just secularly very high they've been marching up and up and up and up since the 80s and they sort of peaked in 2016 and fell off a little bit and kind of chopping around but then under covid corporate profit margins exploded again back to all-time highs because the you know government was giving free money to everyone it's great for business the problem with that is that it makes your debt load look more sustainable than it really is so corporations have been taking on a lot of debt in general um and they've been sort of benchmarking that when you when you evaluate the credit risk of a business you look at okay well what is its EBITDA what is its profit or uh the the cash flow that it can use to service that debt um that's the denominator and then what's the debt is the numerator well if your EBITDA is elevated because your margins are artificially high and that's not sustainable it makes it look like you can you can support much more debt than you would otherwise mm -hmm. and that's a potential major problem because um we think that uh, uh profit margins are have started to mean revert you know going back five or six or seven years to 16 and that this process is likely to continue and if that continues then you're going to see corporate profitability and the cash flow that they have available to service that debt is going to get squeezed and they're going to be in trouble in many cases especially now this is coming to a head with businesses that are refinancing out of debt that was much lower interest rate into nearer term debt which is much higher interest rate so if you want to find businesses that have problems look for you know uh debt maturities that are taking place over the next 18 months because they're going to be in trouble um so that's uh that's the one thing on the corporate side the other thing on the corporate side which we've talked about a little bit which um you know last week we said uh S -S svb is not the the crisis and you shouldn't be looking you know you shouldn't be fighting the, the last war mm -hmm. um and looking for a credit crisis and in the banks and stuff the banks are not going to cause a crisis because the banks have been boring since 2008 and honestly i don't think there will be a banking crisis of the u.s for the rest of my lifetime maybe because these things have to accumulate over decades of complacency more and more risk taking like look at the 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 headline today is elizabeth warren wants to increase even more the regulation around these banks uh they're already highly regulated and they've been increasing their capital ratios and stuff like that so forget about the banks the thing to focus on is private equity markets and that's the other source of over leverage and too much debt because all of these big investors endowments uh foundations have been moving away from public markets and doubling down and doubling down on private equity in large part because you don't have to market to market you can invest in one of these companies and then the private equity fund tells you well it's worth this <laughs> well why is that well because that's what we think it's worth um so that's really reassuring if you have to report to some superior and say well our private equity investments are doing great forget about these public markets that are all over the place um the problem is you know first that there's a lot of complacency which means that a lot of sort of uh 
pardon the phrase, dumb money has gone into private equity at the wrong time, um, which has led to too much investment going on there. Um, and then there's been too much debt laid on these companies. So when you when you do an LBO, when you buy a company, you lever up to buy it, take on debt to buy it. So that's um, that's a particular problem, uh, if, especially if you get sort of this reversion in profit margins like we thought. Because by definition, these companies that are getting bought in the private markets, they're taking on a lot of debt in order to get bought. Mm -hmm. um, so when you look at like where the complacency is, where the aha moment is, like Lehman, where is the Lehman moment? It's in private equity markets. It's in endowments waking up one day and saying, oh shit, like our private equity portfolio, which in some cases is like 30 or 40% of these large endowments investment uh, assets, that that's not worth remotely what we thought it was. And there's sort of this self-reinforcing thing coming into place now because there's a liquidation because these companies are going under, people are having to sell their positions to get liquidity, and that's making it worse. Well, yeah, to your point the, to, about not fighting the last war, the, the asset class that you think is bulletproof, that is the most secure, that is the most resistant to everything is probably right. the one where there's going to be the problem. So the fact that everybody and their, their mother-in-law is talking about banks is probably a sign to you that banks is not where the issue was going to be. Well, but so how do we, how do we square what you just said, which sounded a little bit scary. I was getting a little shivered down my spine listening to it versus, but Hey, inventory cycles go, doing good. And you know, the feds trying to hike rates and it's not putting a damp in a, a, a damper on us consumption. Like how do those parts of the wheels all come together? Is that a timing thing that it's going to take eight, 12 months for that to sort of exhibit itself? How, how do you square those, those two things against each other? Well, you have to be able to hold two different ideas in your head at the same time, right? Because some of those things are longer term. And it's not obvious that there's a huge problem yet in private equity. Um, some of those things are more cyclical and short term. So when I'm talking about the inventory cycle and the business cycle, especially now, because it's it's really shortened because of all the chop. Yeah. Like we use this metaphor all the time, the bathtub with the water just chopping all over instead of these nice, long, smooth waves. That's a much shorter term discussion. That's like six months, eight months kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the debt issues are much longer term than longer lasting. Um, so this is like, okay, watch out for this, but at the same time you have to uh, you have to manage things in in the short term because mm -hmm. that's not going to impact things until it starts to fall apart. But it's the thing to watch for for what's going to fall apart next. Right, if that makes sense. No, 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 it does. Um, all right, well, let's let's stop there and maybe we have to do a little bit of top down market stuff because I know you were bored by the SVB thing. I I confess to being a little bit bored by the China Russia Xi Jinping Vladimir Putin bromance. And that's dangerous because I shouldn't be bored. Um, that's a sign. Bore, boredom is a sign of complacency. Is leads to an analyst being wrong. So I shouldn't be bored about it at all. Um, I don't know if you saw the videos of. I mean, it was very like um, choreographed with you know, Vladimir Putin marching through these solid gold doors and and she coming through his own doors. It was almost like you know one of these reality TV shows like The Bachelor. Like they come in and meet each other and then they're hanging out and you know Putin is so much shorter than she and he's looking up at him. It's it's like oh I, I'm I'm making fun of them. I shouldn't. But um, I, I will say when you actually look at what Russia and China agreed to over the last couple of days, because the big geopolitical news this week is oh she and Putin met and they doubled down their relationship and it's no limits to their friendship. Um, but I just can't get there because one of the things that Russia really wanted was it wants movement on on a pipeline that can connect Siberia to China, which they've been talking about for decades and which would be, as Marco said on this podcast once, you know, we're talking about Panama Canal level type infrastructure development. If you're going to connect Russia's gas fields all the way you know, to sort of the Chinese end user markets, you can do it. And if you could do it, it would be you know tremendous in terms of linking those two. But, you know, don't don't underestimate the scope of the sort of infrastructure problem there. China was kind of like. Uh, like we're not going to commit to that exactly. There's no alliance here. Um, I often, if you've seen me give a speech or if you have found this podcast because you've seen me speak somewhere, you've probably seen me talk before about how China has no allies. 
um, and that that is one of the reasons that, that, that they're so weak in the Indo-Pacific. One of the reasons I, I say that is because it's really true, but I don't have tons of time when I'm just talking for 30 or 45 minutes and I have to do shorthand. One of the reasons China doesn't have allies is because they don't want allies. They reject the idea that the United States has with we need the security environment, we need to have all these defense treaties and things like that. China doesn't like it that way. In some ways, China's very George Washingtonian about it. They don't want foreign entanglements. They just want everybody to be pragmatic and do their own things and let the Chinese do what they want and they'll let you do what you want. And as long as you're not you know, infringing on each other, they're going to look the other way. And that's why they can work with Russia. Russia says, hey, you want Taiwan? Cool. Like, we're not going to object to anything that you're going to do there. Just don't object to the things that we're doing. And so China's sort of like, okay, like, fine, we're, we're not going to do that. Um, I have been wondering, though, like, um, at a certain point, you would think that Xi Jinping won't want his name tied to tacit Russian support even of this war in, in Ukraine. And even as I say that this has been a boring week and, you know, it's been difficult to find something to really sink our teeth into, like the war in Ukraine is still ongoing. And like two big things that even six months ago probably should have been at the front of the New York Times rather than these stupid TikTok hearings are, you know, last week, Poland and Slovakia gave fighter jets to Ukraine, came out and said, okay, we'll give you the MiG-29s. That's a huge deal. So we're going to support the Ukrainian Air Force now. Like we've been talking about that since the first or second month of the war. And then the United States came out this week and said, you know how we were going to send those Abrams tanks in a year or two. All right, we're going to try and get them to you much faster. We're going to try and get them to Ukraine by the fall, which also threw me a loop because I thought we were gearing up for spring summer offensive. So apparently spring summer, not what we're worried about, but we're worried enough about the fall that we need to get those tanks to Ukraine by then because by next year will be too late. So when you put all of those things together, um, I don't quite know what to make of it, but um, I, I, the, the long story short, I want to be bored with this China Russia story, but I probably shouldn't be bored. And the things that China is doing at the diplomatic level in the world are very interesting. I, I don't exactly know what they're gaming for, and that should also put us on edge. Do you think that China has um, uh, sort of punches much below its weight in terms of soft power because they're so kind of pragmatic in that way? Like, do they? What do they stand for? I guess do they? Do they have the ability to project that? So, soft power is a very interesting concept, and if you want to read listeners the paper that creates the concept of soft power it's joseph nye it's a it's a fairly dry paper but it's a good one and then but he's the one that starts that idea of soft power and you can kind of go from there i actually wrote uh, one of my favorite essays that i've ever written this was back in my gpf days i can maybe find a link and we can put it in the podcast description was about the relationship between propaganda and soft power and the thesis of that piece was basically that authoritarian regimes can't really have soft power because they have propaganda. It's very heavy handed. So the Chinese Communist Party decides what image of China it wants its people to consume and wants people outside of China to consume. So internally, you know, the Chinese Communist Party guarantees strength and is going to restore social harmony within the country and provide for prosperity and knock out corruption, things like that. Externally, China has been trying to sell the Belt and Road Initiative or trying to sell China as, you know, this, this civilizational connective power that's going to lead the next phase of globalization and things like that. But that's propaganda. Like they decided at the top levels of the Chinese Communist Party what the message was, was going to be. And it goes down from there. The reason a country like the United States has such immense soft power is because Washington's not telling Hollywood what, what movies to put out. You know, the, the United States government is not telling you what kind of music you can consume or what it wants its artists to be projecting in terms of the world. And that's why people like U.S. art. That's why they like U.S. movies or Western art and Western movies in general. Um, so I don't think China has a great deal of soft power because they don't allow those sort of things to gestate and go out into the world. A nerd like me really likes watching Chinese movies. Um, and in part, I like watching Chinese movies because it tells me, oh, this is what they want me to think about China right now. If you go watch shitty Chinese action movies, they're great because the the adversary, it's never, they never name the United States, but it's always some white dude with a terrible American accent. He's the nefarious actor that's causing problems all in the world. And the brave Chinese vigilante soldier like fixes the problem. It's, it's like a lot of fun. But I don't think most people are watching shitty Chinese action movies on airplanes like I am. Most people are like, no, I want to go watch the Avengers. You might remember we had Andre um, Sushensov on this podcast a month or two after the um, after Russia invaded Ukraine. And one of the questions I asked him was, "What are you guys watching in Russia? Like, what what movies, what TV shows are motivating you?" And he said, "Oh, well, when we're not watching, you know, videos of the Great Patriotic War, we like Star Wars. <laughs> it's like 
okay, like, like, do you see like where the soft power is? So that's a very long winded answer to your question to say that I don't think China has a lot of soft power right now. TikTok is a really interesting hybrid zone there because TikTok isn't, isn't a source of soft power. Like it's not producing content, but it did produce this tool that allowed people to produce content in a certain way. And I guess you could say that maybe that conferred China some soft power, but apparently the United States is just going to gangster up on TikTok and, you know, YouTube and Instagram and Facebook are all going to steal that concept. So I, I don't know how much soft power is really there either. Um, I all, l- last sort of rambly point on this, but I think about this a lot, as you can tell. Um, one of the reasons I love Blade Runner was because like that world that Blade Runner imagined with sort of the Japanese language and the, you know, uh, eating chopsticks in, in, in LA and some sort of weird dystopian LA, you could see this sort of literal melting pot of global cultures and that soft power meant something very different and that Asian powers had risen at some point and their language had gotten into our slang and their food was in the street and there was no, you know, US government or dominant hegemon to kind of rule the world from that perspective. It was much more literally multipolar. Um, you know, maybe that's the world we get in 20 or 30 years. But I mean, sitting here today, I, I don't think most people um, are consuming Chinese soft power assets. If, if anything, it's how do you parse through all of this Chinese propaganda? And I think that's one of that's one of the Achilles heels for authoritarian regimes. Their societies do not produce um, content that is authentic to individuals. It also, I think, also is one of the reasons that authoritarian economies have such hard problems with innovation. Because usually the things that lead to innovation and discovery are deeply personal. It's some scientist who gets obsessed with something and makes a breakthrough and then pushes something forward because he had the space to make mistakes or to fail or to, or to challenge consensus or things like that. Authoritarian regimes really have problems with that. So um, the, the short answer to your question is no, I don't think China has a lot of soft power and they're going to have to really change the way they operate if they want to have soft power because they haven't demonstrated the ability to wield it at all. Um, so I want to, I want to throw out a response to that. That's sort of a, a mix because, um, I, I want to hear your thoughts on this because at the one side, from my perspective, as someone who, you know, kind of consumes things, different sorts of things than, than you on the geopolitics, geopolitics side, um, my sense is that us soft power is really grown, particularly around the internet and media. Um, Elon Musk, I think, obviously is this very controversial figure, but I think Elon Musk, we're going to look back and this is going to be a much bigger part of the conversation around his historical legacy is sort of the crazy audacity, which of course veers into hubris and ridiculous shit all the time, but the audacity to build, the audacity to do things that previously were thought impossible or unthinkable. And if you look at Tesla, you look at SpaceX, these have enormous soft power value, these 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 ventures, these creations. Um, and to a greater extent, I think that represents like the the emergence of the internet economy, the emergence of tech in our lives every day. Um, that I think is still underappreciated how inspiring that is to people of a certain bent all over the world. Mm -hmm. Like you can look here in France and there's like not traditionally the most entrepreneurial place. And you can find people who are responding intellectually to that, who are inspired to build things, to do things, to, you know, whether it's startups of of any kind. Um, That's a very, very powerful force. And I think that's really accelerated in the last 10 years. The flip side to that, and maybe that's, you know, maybe this is soft power appealing to different segments of societies or different groups. But the other side to that is there was a piece on the knowledge platform and I'm scrolling trying to find it now, but you put it on there and it was a speech by Xi Jinping, I believe, that mm-hmm. was talking about sort of, you know, the basically laying out, well, what's the Chinese vision for third, you know, the, the, what used to be known as the third world. Yeah. Like here's how we think you can, and and maybe you can summarize like the gist of it, um, if you remember. But um, no, it, I it was I think it was either a week ago or two weeks ago, and I mean it's hard to keep track of all the different essays and you know thoughts and concepts that Xi Jinping wants you to burn into your eyeballs and your soul if if you're Chinese or if you're in the rest of the world. But his point, his overall point was. <clears throat> 
that U.S. soft power is degrading a little bit because U.S. soft power, I think, has gone from you know bastion of freedom and innovation and expression and things like that to what is the United States doing now? It's us versus them. It's democracy or you're bad. It's uh, even the you know the U.S. is even turning its back on free trade. So it's no more about driving down costs generally. It's America first, and it's it was make America great again for Trump. Biden is just make things in America great. Like you know, it's it's all kind of the same thing. Whereas China is saying, we don't care what your government is like. You want democracy? You don't want democracy? None of our business. We want prosperity. We want people to have freedom. We want to have respective sovereignty all around the world. But that's the point where it really breaks down for them, right? Because they want respective sovereignty in part because they want the world to say Taiwan is a sovereign part of China. And uh, this week, Honduras is, by the way, Um, throwing out its recognition of Taiwan to embrace relations with China. China's slowly chipping away. So I think it's going to be only 12 countries left in the world, which is the United States is not one of them that still recognize Taiwan. So that that is Chinese soft power saying, yeah, you want access to our economy? You want access to all the cool things that we do? Uh, You can't recognize Taiwan. That's sort of the price for it. But at the same time, they're saying respect for sovereignty. We respect sovereignty and borders and all these other things. And yet Xi Jinping is hanging out with Vlad in the gold doors and doing the reality show thing that I just talked about. That doesn't quite work because China recognizes Ukraine as a sovereign country. I'm really, really curious what Xi Jinping is going to say to Zelensky when he speaks to him on the phone in the next week or two like he's talking about because they haven't talked since the war began. And China didn't just announce this visit with Putin this week. They also said she intends to talk to Zelensky on the, fo- on the phone for the first time since the war began, which set off all sort of was this Iran, Saudi, China broker deal just the beginning? Is China going to try and become sort of the centralized thing? But yeah, to, to your point, the the vision that she was trying to explain of the world was to say, okay, the United States has this vision of you know freedom and liberalism and all these other things, but what are they actually doing? They're invading Iraq and trying to force feed them democracy. They're cutting off our economy. They're, they're causing all these different problems all around the world. Wouldn't it be nicer to just deal with a country that is pragmatic and supports you and whatever your goals are for your particular government? They're, they're trying to sort of steal that mantle. Um, John Minnick, who's been on this podcast a couple of different times, for my money is the best, or not the best. I mean, it's one of the most um, astute observers of Chinese politics in general. Um, and he was my college roommate, so we, we've kept in touch and I've had him on the podcast a couple of times. But I remember back in college at Cornell, uh, he was talking about the the odd similarities between the way China conceives of its role today and the way the United States conceived of its role in the 1890s and early 1900s and 1910s, because we played that role in that version of the economy. We were the world's factory. We were the sort of in, inexhaustible land of labor and and all these other things. And China has sort of supplanted us. And now you can see those nascent signs of them trying to express something abroad. So th- that was that was China's message. But even within that message, I think you can see um, the weaknesses of, of Chinese soft power because that's not Xi expressing a grassroots view of China. I really do think that is Xi and the Chinese Communist Party trying to apply something for the, from the top down. And that, as the United States is learning and has learned in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, you can't really do it from the top down. The, the entire foundation of us soft power is that it has nothing to do with government it has everything to do with the bottoms up and what you allow individuals to do in systems where they're relatively free well that's kind of what i'm getting at uh, sort of the counter argument to my us increasing soft power thing uh, because i agree with what you're saying that it really shows the hollowness of of china's soft power but at the same time um so i really like stephen kotkin as you know mm-hmm. Yep. And someone asked you to get him as a guest on here, and I would love for that because I'm a I'm a super Stephen Cotkin nerd uh, uh, fan. But one of the things uh, that I really like about him is his description of the U.S. Soviet sort of um, interaction in the later years of the Soviet Empire. Like in many ways, why did it fall? Why did the U.S. win? And um, you know, we like to think, I, I, I think we, we like to think that the U.S. has this soft power because of those values, because like, you know, we're the city on the hill and, you know, freedom, you know, it's sort of more philosophical ideas. And one of the things that he points out is like, I don't know if that's really the case. The thing that really at the end of the day was so powerful that caused, you know, Eastern Europe that caused Soviet elites 
to envy the U.S. and caused you know countries that were vying that we were vying to to gain influence with to turn toward us was not necessarily all this highfalutin uh, uh, verbiage. It was the fact that we were rich. That, that that like they wanted our stuff. They wanted whiskey and cars and clothes and 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 refrigerators and all the stuff that we had. And as the gap, just the sheer pragmatic physical gap between the amount of stuff that we had versus the Soviets, which wasn't as you know big of a difference in 1950, but by 1980 it was a huge difference. That that alone had such an enormous power. And if you looked at the behavior of elites, they didn't have Soviet cars. They had, you know, European cars. And then they had, you know, perfumes that they would give to their wives that were from, you know, Europe and the United States and all of these all of these consumer goods that they were striving after. And and what I'm getting at is like while I agree that the the notion of Chinese soft power in this sort of ideological sense seems pretty hollow in that way. Um, I do think that one of the big kind of, not existential, but major, major challenges that the US now faces to its own soft power is the fact that China's gotten rich without, without being free mm -hmm. and having an authoritarian government. And if you're an authoritarian in a piss poor, shitty country, and you're trying to figure out how to proceed, I think that's a very inspiring example um, that didn't exist before, and 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 has never existed in history, because no country has gotten as rich as China or as big as China without being a Western liberal uh, political uh, entity. And that seems like a big thing, but what do you what do you think about that idea? Is that true? Is Japan a Western political entity? Was South Korea a Western political entity when it had its growth miracle? I mean, like it certainly had to imbibe aspects of it, but I mean, South Korean democracy is fairly young. Japan, like one of the genius of the United States after World War II, was that we let Japan keep its regime. They imbibed some of the aspects of Western liberalism, but they also kept aspects that were distinctive of them. So. I, I take your point though, like China's China's model of development is very attractive in the same way that part of the reason the Cold War was between the Soviet Union and the United States was because the Soviet model of development in the 1950s was very attractive. Because if you looked at where the Soviet Union was versus the 1920s, the Soviet Union industrialized and modernized at an incredibly rapid pace. They, you know, just a couple of years after the US had nukes, the Soviets had nukes too. And to your point, they lost the competition over time because their economy couldn't really compete. A great example of this is the space race. Like, okay, they got there first. They had the top-down priority. We had the top-down priority too, and we put men on the moon and everything else. But then look at all the different innovations that came out of the space program that continue to fundamentally affect our economy today. We didn't just stop with putting a man on the moon. American entrepreneurs did all these other different things. And I think that's the part that's missing. You mentioned Elon Musk. Um, gross, but you're right. Um, if you're Chinese, like who are you looking to? Are you looking to Jack Ma, who's fled to Tokyo or whatever the reports say because he got his knees cut out from underneath him because he had the gall to to challenge, you know, Xi Jinping? Like you don't have that kind of, um, I think, model or that kind of impetus to go forward. So, um, but yeah, I, I take your point that China's model is something that if you're in, if you are in a country that has its own problems and you you don't feel like you can embrace this western style of democracy that doesn't work in your own country like china does offer a very compelling path forward and there are aspects of the chinese economy that i am jealous of i make this joke all the time i hope if if chinese strategic Gosh. thinkers are listening to this podcast please please come build the belt and road initiative in the state of louisiana please modernize our ports and put in all the high speed rail and please connect new orleans to especially Atlanta, Austin, and New York City. It would be really nice to have high-speed rail for my own personal life in those, so, for, for those different cities. So please, come build. There was a, a, a something I tweeted this week was a picture of high-speed oh, rail build good. in China over the, since 2008 versus the United States. The, the version of the United States was what? It was like a, I think it was like a mall or something built like a tram that went from one point A to point B. And China's built an entire high-speed rail network in that entire time. Um, 
you know, maybe they're not going to be at the at the forefront of, you know, ultraviolet lithography equipment. But hey, at least they can get from point A to point B without it taking five hours and everything else that's happening. So I, I take your point from that point of view too. They they are wealthy and rich in ways and and can emphasize things in ways that we can't. Another great example of this. Um, it's not just about hard infrastructure. Think about five G. Huawei. The reason the United States went after Huawei as hard as it did was because Huawei was the best telecoms five G company in the world. They produced the best equipment for the cheapest price. And the only other players in the game were Nokia and Ericsson. Like there wasn't really a U.S. company. We still don't make a lot of the in- components and parts in the United States that you need to go into these things. So on that level, yes, like China is at that stage of its development. The interesting question is whether once you have prosperity, do you have to give freedom or will people consent to be not free once they've had a taste of what prosperity looks like? And the other, the other thing to note there is China is not, even though China has gotten rich, sort of on a per capita basis and in a sort of regional basis, not all of China has gotten rich. So now China has to do this bait and switch where it has to enrich the rest of the population or convince the rest of the population that going from $1 a day, from living on $1 a day to $5 a day was what the Chinese Communist Party meant when it promised prosperity. And now you have to be a good soldier and we have to take back Taiwan. So, um, Well, I think that's one of the biggest and most troubling questions if you are interested in economics or development that you can that you can really point to is um you know your point about japan and korea sort of forging the path before china i think is correct but at the same time you saw some people trying to emulate japan in particular like um for example when turkey had its revolution and you know the ottoman empire fell in the early 20s they very specifically were driven by the example of Japan. You know, development without westernization was the mantra. But that was fairly limited because, you know, when Japan really got rich, even though I think Japan is a much less liberal society than most people assume, and, um, you know, in many ways, they're very good at sort of keeping the U.S. at arm's length, but making us think that they're totally in our pocket. Um uh, you know, I think they're fundamentally viewed as part of the U.S. orbit, sort of our, this sounds terrible, but sort of our lackeys in some way, which is not really true, but that's in some ways the perception. And similar for Korea, and Koreans, very small, just population-wise or whatever. They're not foremost in a lot of people's minds. China is like the Mac Daddy. China is like Jupiter, and, you know, maybe Japan is, is Uranus or something. Um <laughs> <laughs> bad, uh, bad choice. Um, and and the thing that I think about China a lot that I I don't know the answer to, but I wonder about it, is like how good are they really? Because inevitably, like I always talk about the Chinese property bubble, and like China has enormous problems. And I think even even though this sentiment toward China has become much more guarded, much much more bearish from a economic standpoint. I still think people vastly underestimate the problems that they have, the huge, huge problems that they face over the next decade um, that are very similar to what the Soviet Union faced, just in terms of you know authoritarian regimes having massive inefficiency and wealth destruction and waste that gets hidden until it gets revealed. And now it's starting to get revealed. Yeah, I'll play devil's advocate a little there, which is because um, I was thinking more while you were talking. Was the U.S. really free and democratic when it got rich? Because I'm not sure if we can make that argument. If because I mean, there's one part there, which is you know, women didn't have the vote in the United States until what 1919, I think, is the year. You didn't have direct election in primaries and things like that. I, I think until around the same time. So when you're the United States and it's the era it's the era of the robber barons and politicians are picked in you know smoke filled rooms behind the scenes and it's whoever everybody wants to decide is the best uh, for the given economic situation like that's not like analogous to the democratic free environment that the United States exists in today. I'd also point out that a lot of the U.S. advances came during moments or crises or emergencies where the United States government did behave in an authoritarian manner. So think about the Civil War on the one hand. I mean, Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus, like they integrated the South back in. Like for a while there, the United States, you could argue, was not a free country. Think also about the role of the U.S. government in World Wars I and II. 
like part of the massive growth that we've had in the United States was because the U.S. government literally basically took over the U.S. economy for a couple of years in the context of World War One. The reason you get the roaring 20s and then the crash afterwards is because that control of the U.S. government where we say, OK, we're now going to harness all of this great energy and we're going to do this. We're going to fight this war across the world that creates all sorts of growth. World War Two does it on steroids. We're going to amass all this energy. We're going to fight two wars on two different continents, something that really had never been done before and all the things that sort of come out of that. Um, and a, a sort of modern example of this is what is a country today that is really struggling to do what the United States did and what China has done is India. India, which really is a democracy. And one of the problems with India is the government can't get anyone to do the things that it says. It's a billion plus people. It's free. It's got all these things that you would think, but they're talking about self-reliance they can't even, you know, it, it's it's a big deal for India to even get the tax code harmonized in different regions from one place to the other. It's a big deal for India to have water infrastructure in the entire country, let alone port infrastructure and high speed rail and all these special economic zones that China's been able to build. So, the the rejoinder to your question might be, you need a little bit of of, of authoritarianism and the greater good sort of thinking. Anytime you're going to get an economic growth miracle, and the United States had its moments there too. The United States also was was willing to give power back to the people, though, after a particular time period. And China's not really showing that, at least not right now. Well, I'm going to push back on that a little bit because good. <laughs> the. The, the 19th century example, I don't think is comparable because if you look at the size of the US government or any government at that time, you simply didn't have the kind of state capacity to control mm -hmm. things that you did, that you do today, yep. um, for example. So like the US federal government was tiny until the 1930s um, and after the Great Depression where you they had to, you know, expand enormously in a very short amount of time so i don't think we had the ability like yes you know there was um illiberal aspects of society you know at, at the social level with you know female rights or you know all these sorts of things uh, but i don't think that's apples to apples or, um, or slavery well yeah of course um you know it's just a completely different historical time um but but for but but to bring it back to China, this is part of China's point. China says, no, this wasn't a different historical time. This was just a hundred or two hundred years ago, and you did all these terrible things in your society, and now you're lecturing us about what we want to do. I'm not saying I approve or disapprove of that. I'm just saying when you think about the Chinese Communist Party's argument back to the United States, part of it is like, who are you to talk to us? Like, 150 years ago, you had slaves who were building your economy. Yeah, and of course you can make the. You know the what about the what about tisms? What about slavery? What about this? What about that? Um, I mean, this is very common, um, but I think it's hard to argue that there's not a fundamental difference between the Soviet Union or the you know China today in terms of like yes, during World War One or World War Two, you had periods in you know especially during World War Two. Take that example where we were in wartime, basically the entire industrial economy was commandeered by the government. Um, of course, that's a very special example. But, the, you, you know, China's like that on steroids and and without stopping for very long periods of time. Um, so it's, it's fundamentally different, I think, in terms of liberalism versus authoritarianism. And, and I, like, of course, and this is something we talk about a lot in terms of innovation. So like in terms of innovation, the state is, is essential. And if you look at World War II, so much of our modern technology, like we talk about this, a common theme, and as we roll out our innovation strategy and our innovation research, this is a major thing that we're really thinking deeply about is how does the state create the necessary preconditions for early stage technology development that the private sector just won't or cannot mm -hmm. have the patience for or or the motivations for because it's not profitable on any reasonable time horizon um so in that sense it's like it's like the incredible hulk so the incredible hulk is great when he can turn into the hulk when he needs to kick some ass but then he turns back into bruce banner and he's a normal you know scientist but like 
you can't have the Incredible Hulk that gets stuck in Hulk mode because then that becomes unhealthy. So China is like stuck in Incredible Hulk mode and the US during World War II or during very specific things where we're bulking up and saying, okay, we're going to have this objective. Oh shit, Sputnik moment. Let's put everything into space and do this. Like that's the healthy Incredible Hulk. Like that's uh, no, no, <laughs> a metaphor for it. No, it's good, but I I feel like in the recent I can't remember which one it was, but wasn't there a while in the recent Avengers uh, movies where he did get stuck in Incredible Hulk land, and the only thing that could talk him down was Scarlett Johansson's character being like, "Hey, everything's going to be okay." I mean, we I'm sure all of us could uh, deal with Scarlett Johansson telling us to calm down, and we would probably listen to it, not just the Incredible Hulk. But I, I take your I'm not trying to make moral equivalencies. I hate moral equivalencies like. In some ways, they're not interesting arguments to me. But yes, the United States, Soviet Union, qualitatively different. I think the only thing I would, I would push back against you there is that China's future is not written yet. Um, China's still at sort of the introductory phases of what it's going to do with the position that it's assumed right now. So we can say on a moral level, we can make a moral equivalency argument about the United States and the Soviet Union because the United States, you know, maybe had some illiberal beginnings or terrible things in its history, its original sins. They're all there. We don't dismiss them. But look at what the United States became. Look at how it. Grow, it grew and evolved and came to, you know, really try and banish some aspects of that or change for the better. We can talk about how imperfect or incomplete it is, but like actually tried, whereas the Soviet Union never tried. It never admitted it was wrong about anything. And then it came crashing down and the whole edifice collapsed. And we're still dealing that with that today in the Russia-Ukraine war. I, I brought up Blade Runner earlier, and this sort of brings us full circle in this conversation. In the 1980s, People thought Japan was going to have soft power. People thought everybody was going to emulate Japan. And then the Japanese model crashed in on itself. And one of the reasons Blade Runner, the old Blade Runner, doesn't make sense today and why they had to update it, which they did so beautifully with Blade Runner 2049, was because Japan went away. It didn't actually happen. It's hard to imagine the streets of LA with Japanese signs on them because Japan didn't take over the world. I think the question is, what does China do from here? Can you imagine a world 30 years from now where China is different, where Xi Jinping was the emperor who seized control of the state in order to redistribute wealth to the interior. And then once he was done with his task, he decided to give power back to the people and went back to some sort of established, okay, like we're going to go back to party consensus about who's going to be chosen rulers and we'll even empower the peoples and the regions a little bit because I'm not afraid of these different regions being corrupt or trying to challenge the center or things like that. That's a very, very optimistic, naive, um, prediction. I don't think it's at all. I, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't even call it a prediction. I'm just saying it's a possibility. Like we will speak about China much differently if that is the sort of trajectory that China takes over the next 30 years versus if it takes the Japanese trajectory where the economy just collapses in on itself and it has lost decades versus the worst case scenario, which you're describing, which is the Soviet Union, which is it can't get out of Hulk mode. It has to repress and crack down more and more and more, even as its need for innovation, econ economic growth is more and more. And eventually those things will come to a head. So um, one of the reasons China is so interesting is because like it's where the future is being written right now. It's the one like it, it, its future is sort of ahead of it. Like I think we also forget, we think of Chinese civilization being thousands of years old and all these other things. The People's Republic of China is not that old. Um, there are not many countries in the world that are younger than the United States. The United States was formed in 1776 and in its form today with, you know, all dominating North America, even, even younger than that. China's younger than the United States. This iteration, this version of China, one of the youngest countries in the world and yet is as powerful and, and as rich as it is. So I would just say, like the space for like just because China has been authoritarianism because of its past doesn't mean it's always going to be authoritarian in its future and maybe it will chart some different course but maybe it also won't. <laughs> well, that's another thing. Not so good to uh, go down all these rabbit holes, but that's another thing I wonder about a lot because I've been reading a lot about medieval Europe in the last few weeks, mm. and like France during the Merovingian and Carolingian periods, and how you saw these patterns where like during certain extended periods of time, you would have power get centralized and authority sort of uh, kind of fall within one or two major figures. And then it would inevitably dissipate and authority would weaken in large part because you couldn't project power. Like you just physically couldn't project power over long distances. You couldn't yeah. keep track of what was going on. You couldn't communicate fast enough. Um, and uh, the the, another historical analog, which I find is interesting, is the Ottoman Empire experienced much of the same thing, where the Ottoman Empire was actually super centralized in the 1500s, and they became 
increasingly less centralized in contrast to all the European states because they just couldn't they couldn't control all these lo local autocrats and power centers. And then in the 1900s, when the telegraph um, got invented, they were the most enthusiastic. The Ottoman Sultan was the most enthusiastic adopter of the telegraph because he saw it as a tool to finally crack down and like put people in all these little local areas who could keep tabs and literally just you know communicate faster. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm getting at is China today is a you know still a very decentralized place, and we way overstate how centralized power truly is because it's a very you know the hills are high and the emperor is far away. Like that's still very much the case, um, but it's also changed at the margin much more toward centralization. And if you look at what they've done with sort of the the apparatus of state monitoring of propaganda like that's a technological development like the the great firewall the hundreds of thousands of people who work monitoring chinese citizens and mm -hmm. you know keeping tabs on what they're saying and what i wonder is is there a technology element where you kind of once you go down a certain path it's very difficult to like like, okay, say Xi Jinping is going to say, okay, well, now we're going to liberalize. Well, was he going to fire 200,000, you know, uh, uh, monitors? You know what I mean? Like, you build these bureaucratic uh, apparatus, these bureaucratic tools, these technology tools, and then is it hard to give them up is, is one, one thing I wonder about, if that well, makes sense. It does, and that's where his Marxism probably comes into defining his worldview. But that's probably a whole other podcast because if we're going to explain sort of how how Marxism with Leninism with Chinese characteristics is going to predict what they think is going to unfold for their society, it's going to take us some time. Listeners, if you were playing along with the CI cognitive dissidents drinking game, uh, you know Rob ref, uh, referenced Merovingian empires here at what about the hour two mark? So I hope you took a drink. Otherwise, we will be back next week. <laughs> <laughs> with our normally scheduled programming. So cheers and see you after. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.